you so much for joining me today for Health Privacy in a Digital World. I just wanted to go over some objectives for today. So by the end of today's workshop, I want you to be able to be a little bit less overwhelmed by conversations about privacy. Today, we're going to explore privacy issues associated with health data. We're going to explain some popular health apps and tools. And then we're going to identify vulnerable moments in our health journey. And we're going to kind of go over broadly a lot of this stuff, talk about some big ideas, and then we'll zoom in a little bit too and talk about some particular apps and tools, some particular privacy concerns, and more. So my agenda for today, I'm going to introduce you to Library Freedom Project. I'm going to talk a little bit about what health data actually is, and then I'll talk about some apps and tools, and I'll talk finally about how library workers can help, can support folks in their health journey. So my name is Tess Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a health sciences librarian at the University of Pittsburgh. I also did my MLIS there, and it was during that time that I got interested in the intersections of privacy and librarianship. I was a research assistant with the Youth Data Literacy Project, which took a look at teens and their relationship to privacy, as well as youth services librarians and how they can integrate those conversations into programming. And during that time, I also got involved with Library Freedom Project through their Library Freedom Institute. And in my current position, I manage funding for libraries, community organizations, bringing health literacy into their spaces. And that can take a lot of different forms. So that could be a fitness workshop uh, supported by local experts. It could be a community health fair. It could be scheduling health screenings in their space. I also train library staff organizations, and anyone else really who's interested in how to navigate National Library of Medicine resources and offer ideas about how to incorporate those into their library practice. So why is a health sciences librarian talking to you about online privacy? Well, we live in a digital world and practices and processes regarding privacy change daily, and they get increasingly more difficult to navigate. And I consider digital health to be something that affects us all, especially vulnerable populations, our seniors, young children, immigrant and refugee neighbors, and a lot of other subsets of our global community. So I want to preface this workshop also by saying that we acknowledge a lot in the Library Freedom Project community that we are not experts. Um, it's really hard. It might be is impossible to become an expert in something like privacy that's changing every single day. What we can do, though, is keep learning, keep sharing, and equip folks with the tools and techniques they need to combat surveillance and manage their own privacy. And that's what we're here to do today. And before we really dive in, like I said, I wanted to do a short introduction to Library Freedom Project, in case some of you aren't familiar. Library Freedom Project is a group that teaches library workers about surveillance issues, privacy rights, digital tools, all of that to support the fight against those issues. The project began in 2015 when the Kilton Public Library in New Hampshire was the first public library to run Tor, which is an anonymity service for internet users. And they ran that on their extra bandwidth. Shortly after that service began, it was halted because the library got a heads up from the Department of Homeland Security, and they highlighted the criminal uses of Tor. But eventually, with the support of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, the Tor Project, and members of the public, the service was renewed. But that threat prompted folks to start Library Freedom Project, which is a community of practice that supports not just the cohorts of Library Freedom Institute and our crash courses, but we also are a community of practice and of continuous advocacy. So we present at conferences, we organize protests at conferences, facilitate learning opportunities all over the country and contribute to publications, etc. Like I said, it's hard to become a true privacy expert because our digital world is changing a lot every day, but this group helps us stay informed. And I wanted to introduce you to the library freedom teaching philosophy as a kind of framework to our conversation today as an introduction to the way we think about teaching privacy. And I'll go over this towards the end as well when I talk about teaching privacy. We believe it's possible for people in our community to change we believe that people are the experts of their own lives. We also believe that everyone brings something to the table. We recognize power dynamics in the world and in the room. We're ready to take risks and willing to be vulnerable. We challenge and confront dominant ideologies and systems of oppression, and we recognize trauma and how it plays a role in privacy issues. 
And finally, I just wanted to take a moment to plug the Library Freedom Project Crash Courses. They're free, privacy-focused, two-month trainings for librarians to learn how to become privacy champions in their libraries. The most recent one focused on privacy in library infrastructure, so that included topics like creating good privacy and data governance policies, conducting privacy audits, working with library IT, understanding vendor agreements from a privacy perspective, and a lot more. So they do cover some technical stuff, but they're intended for library workers without a formal technical background or role. You can find out more at that link or just email me or look it up online. What is health data? As you can imagine, there are tons of places where issues of privacy and health information intersect. Digital health information seeking brings with it some really specific privacy concerns, and these are amplified for members of marginalized communities or folks who have been historically underrepresented or ignored by medical history. So first, let's take a quick look at an often confusing and often misattributed act, HIPAA. Becky Use recently wrote a piece about HIPAA and libraries for ALA, if you're interested in learning more. But here are some basics. So the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act governs the handling and processing of protected health information, PHI, in the United States. And HIPAA's scope includes covered entities, which are hospitals, health insurers, healthcare clearinghouses, as well as business associates. So that could be any person or organization that works with PHI on behalf of those covered entities. The privacy rule and security rule, along with high tech, require covered entities and business associates to follow really strict rules and procedures to protect that private health information. Now, HIPAA's scope does not extend to the majority of libraries unless the library in question is part of a covered entity or business associate. Could be a hospital library. Traditionally, the extent of medical data collected by libraries comes in the way of the user's activity in the library, like using health resources, attending programs about health topics. In addition, libraries might also retain some health-related information through certain ADA accommodations for library users, and that information, while not covered under HIPAA, should be given additional protection and consideration by staff for the public. HIPAA was enacted to protect employees with pre-existing conditions from losing their insurance when they change jobs. Title II of the Act was the Administrative Simplification Act, and that created transaction standards to ease the exchange of data between those constituents. They also added some privacy and security protections. For a lot of us, the definitions and differences between PII, which you might have heard, and PHI can be a little bit confusing. So I'm just going to go over those briefly. So as we talk about privacy and health information, this is the term PII, personally identifiable information. PII is information that can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, either alone when combined uh, with other personal or identifying information that's linked or linkable to a specific individual. Some information that's considered to be PII is available in public sources like telephone books, public websites, university listings, things like that. And that type of information is considered to be public PII. So that could be like first and last name, address, work telephone number, email address. Examples of sensitive PII include your mother's maiden name, driver's license number, relatives' names, biometric information, a cell number, your social security number, and the date or place of birth, or really any other information that would make an individual's personal identity easy to trace. The HIPAA privacy rule provides federal protections for PHI, uh, which is protected health information. So what exactly is protected health information? For healthcare providers and insurance companies, the definition is pretty broad. The Department of Health and Human Services lists the 18 HIPAA identifiers, as you can see on screen. So that's patient names, geographical data, fax numbers, email addresses, full face photographic images, biometric elements like finger, retinal, and voice prints, and other identifying numbers or codes. And beyond that, what other personal data is potentially at risk during our health journey? One specific piece of data is location. Um, so we know our devices track us, even if you turn your phone off or you stick it in a Faraday pouch, which is a, a way to shield electronic devices. A really 
fascinating thing if you want to look it up and a very fun activity to bring to your library. When you turn it back on, it will ping a cell tower or a Wi-Fi network. So it's very hard to truly keep our phones from tracking our location. And each phone has a unique identifier. And we know now that Google records location, even if you ask it not to on your Android. An iPhone leaks less data, but that's also not necessarily true of its apps. So for example, text messages. Texts might not be private. Depending on what app you use to text your messages, your metadata, which is information about your messages, like phone numbers of people you text, it might be more easily seen by people other than the recipient than we might think. Those folks could include service providers, people with access to your phone, like a spouse or a parent. It could also include scammers, hackers, governments, and other bad actors. Now, some points of contact that involve your personal information being accessed by someone or by some company that are specifically relevant to digital health information include online intake forms. So when we fill out our intake forms, many of which are online now, we provide a lot of personal information in medical forms, and that could include our medical history, prescriptions. Another place is mobile health apps and devices. Many mobile health apps collect sensitive information. So that could include workout guides, meal or water tracking apps, running or walking map apps, or apps that connect to health devices like Fitbits, Apple Watches, Pelotons, whatever. What we should keep in mind when we consider health apps and devices is that even when those apps claim to value our privacy, your phone or computer might have different data privacy settings. So it can be difficult to get a handle on what data is being shared with whom. And remember when we deal with apps, if the app is free, you might be paying with your data. Digital health programs are another place where personal information could be accessed. So health programs like Noom or other digital plans can collect personal information. Some even collect health records. Medication services, so services like prescription discount programs, they often require some personal information in order to access your health history or insurance information for prescriptions. And insurance paperwork. So speaking of insurance, many of our insurance companies are online or maybe strictly online these days. We might receive digital health insurance cards or need to link our doctor's offices with our insurance companies. Other digital health privacy concerns might include uh, sending PDF forms that include health information or PII and consumer genetic research or DNA tests. So those include a lot of personal information too and can be accessed by a lot of folks. If you take a look at this map on screen, you can see a web of these connections and places where your health data might end up. So let's take a closer look at these connections. So this web map is from the data map. And you can check that out for yourself at thedatamap.org, which is a, a really cool, interesting site. So this is a research project in the Data Privacy Lab, which is a program in the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. When you interact with an organization, you often leave behind personal information, and that organization might share that personal information with other organizations without you knowing about it. So that hidden data sharing can also cause you harm by making that data available to third parties without your knowledge, while at the same time, it can make it difficult for third parties with a legitimate interest in your data to obtain it in ways that benefit you. So this tool allows you to take a closer look at your data flows. As you can see, one of the biggest points on this health map is discharge data. So let's take a closer look at that. So hospital consortiums or entities authorized by the state receive patient health data from providers like hospitals, physicians, and distribute that information to researchers, analytic companies, prescription analytic companies, public health departments, the CDC, other government entities, online websites, employee unions. States and hospital consortiums receive patient health data from providers, and in a lot of states, they make that data public once certain identifiers like patient name and birth date have been removed or made less detailed. So once it's anonymized a little bit, it can be publicly available. So if we take a closer look at New York and New Jersey, we can see what information is shared and how. So this is a great tool for anyone who's curious to know more about your health data flows and how those thread through various organizations. So what's at stake if someone does get a hold of our health data or personal data? Why should we care? 
let's go back to our definition of PII. This is any information that could be used to identify an individual. Now keep in mind that some information, for instance, where or when you were born, it might not constitute PII as they wouldn't on their own allow someone to identify you. But if someone were to get a hold of several pieces of that information, it could make it very easy to identify an individual. So that's what we're worried about when we talk about the risk involved with using health apps and other vulnerable points in our digital health journey. Of course, there are concerns about targeted advertising. My clicks and views get filtered down into tailored ads and content gets pushed to me based on my interests and needs. Ad brokers use health information for targeted advertising. One example of that is between patient information and shopping history. Companies can determine if someone is possibly pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Now, it might seem helpful if creepy, but imagine that person is in a risky situation, an abusive relationship. What if that information might get them hurt or in trouble? Or if they lose a pregnancy, this can quickly become a very personal and harmful privacy risk. Because as we discussed, HIPAA doesn't cover private companies and their use of consumer health data, legislation protecting the sharing of that data is really limited. So some of the other players that might want to access your data include financial institutions involved with approving credit card applications, mortgages. Researchers use data a lot to identify individuals who fit criteria for clinical trials, for drug studies, for other analysis. Analytics companies, they buy and aggregate and then sell data to pharmaceutical companies, health insurance companies, law enforcement agencies, They can purchase genetic coding data from DNA test companies like 23andMe and others, employee unions, law firms, media companies. And then there are larger, larger concerns as well. So medical identity theft can really impact the care that you're able to get, the benefits you can use, your credit score. Data that is leaked can affect your health insurance premiums, life insurance. Data can be de-anonymized. So Data Map, that resource I was talking about earlier, that website, was able to identify just under half of the anonymous records it purchased for $50. So if you want to go to their site, you can see an example of this, how they traced that data back and sort of de-anonymized it. It could result in discrimination based on diagnoses, any disabilities, et cetera. It could result in discrimination based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, health history. Targeted ads can, as I said, cause actual real harm. They could result in disinformation. Some harmful messaging is targeted towards those most receptive to messaging and therefore less likely to challenge that messaging. It could expose you to online snake oil. So again, disinformation, scamming, other things like that. And machine learning algorithms might miss things like that pregnancy example. They might not be able to understand the nuances of someone's health journey. And so those targeted ads could cause real harm and maybe get people into really sticky situations. And those targeted ads as well. So gambling ads, what if they are shown to someone with a gambling addiction? Exercise apps shown to someone uh, with an eating disorder, things like that. And we have to remember that not everyone is impacted by health data surveillance in the same way because of gaps in understanding privacy policies, understanding health literacy, and access to reliable information. So we have to consider all that in context with those existing systemic issues that disproportionately harm marginalized groups. And that's where library workers come in. We'll talk a bit about that today, but more on the 26th about how we can support our communities in their health data journeys. So I wanted to go over some specific health tools and apps that we might use or encounter in our library. Telehealth has been used in healthcare for a number of years, but the landscape of telehealth and digital health has changed significantly since 2020. So apps served us differently during the pandemic. People were spending more time on them and using digital tools more than ever because of lockdowns and an increased desire for convenience and access to healthcare and telehealth needs. So the more time we spent inside and the more we needed to manage a lot of aspects of our lives online, including our physical and mental health, we increased our usage of online medical wellness and fitness apps. And as gyms shut down, everything from yoga and mindfulness apps to real-time competitive cycling to fitness tracking, those all saw growth during that time. 
Consumer health apps, for example, are some of the most widely available and used digital tools. And in 2020, more than 90,000 new apps were released, which resulted in more than 350,000 that are currently available. A 2020 Forbes article reported that app usage surged 40% during the pandemic, and it reached an all-time high of over 200 billion hours during April of 2020. So while that's a global trend, stats on individual countries vary. Italy and Indonesia, for example, saw growth of 30% and 25% respectively. And in the U.S., time spent on apps grew 15%. And this surge of usage goes beyond apps, too. So the demand for indoor sports equipment was huge. As anyone who maybe was interested in purchasing a stationary bike might have noticed, um, Peloton surged 66%. Even despite the shipping delays, the price tag, which is pretty expensive, and the high monthly fee for the related app. So people bought them anyway. So just as consumers have turned to the internet for fitness solutions, Wellness apps have surged as consumers looked to manage all the stress caused by that health crisis. So Headspace, a meditation and mindfulness app, saw up to a 90% increase in time spent on mobile devices. And the company introduced, uh, I think in April of 2020, a section just for New Yorkers, and it was offering all U.S. healthcare professionals who had a national provider identifier, an NPI free access to Headspace Plus, so it increased even more. This app and others like it, they provide tools for adults, but they also provide tools for kids using mobile apps. And youth and privacy online is a a whole different conversation for another day, but kids using health apps can also be a really vulnerable point. IQVIA, which is a pharmaceutical research and data company, they had the following findings regarding health apps and tools. These are just a couple. One was that the use of wearables, connected sensors, and digital biomarkers is expanding. So they are gaining adoption in clinical trials and enabling remote monitoring of patients. So that could be if you are participating in a clinical trial, maybe they provide you with a pedometer or they provide you with a Fitbit, something like that. Sensors and biomarkers are being incorporated into the design of a lot of these clinical trials for pharmaceuticals and medical devices, and they are just becoming a bigger part of those conversations and those trials. Another finding was that incorporating software as a a means to treat, prevent, or manage specific diseases and conditions has increased. So more than 250 such products are now identified, including about 150 products commercially available, and the rest in development. So that's incorporating software into a health journey to prevent, manage diseases, and treat certain diseases as well. So the rise in health apps and digital health tools mean that terms of service are becoming a vital part of this conversation. We agree to tons of these terms of service, more and more every single day. So what are we really agreeing to? When we click that box, I agree, we rarely have the time to read the terms and conditions to find out what data we're giving away and how our data is being used. I actually have a filter on my inbox that sorts any email notifying me of changes in terms of service into a labeled folder, just for curiosity's sake. I'm sure you get a ton of these emails too. It seems like every week I get one. One interesting thing to do is to use control F in those emails to find words like personal or data to really zoom in on the parts that impact you and your data. And one great tool for researching terms of service is terms of service didn't read. We'll talk about that more in just a second. This is an online database of reviews of terms of service and how much they prioritize or how little they prioritize privacy. So on the screen is an example of what this website looks like and what it does. And it grades apps and sites, as you can see here. So this particular review is of an app and a site called Meredith, which is the host for some mindfulness apps, some personal wellness services. As you can see, they did not get a good rating. E is the worst rating a site can get. In fact, for reference, Facebook, Amazon, Reddit, and YouTube all receive E's as well. This is the rating system they use. As you can see, the ratings increase in seriousness of concerns as they move closer to E. So grade A treats you fairly, gives you your rights, won't abuse your data, and then so on and so forth until E, which is there are a lot of red flags in these terms of service. 
Now, Meredith's terms of service get dinged for a few reasons that sort of exemplify some of the concerns we should consider when it comes to health apps and tools. The first concern is this, your identity is used in ads that are shown to other users. So from the terms of service, it says you grant Meredith and anyone authorized by Meredith the right to identify you as the author of your content by name, email address, or screen name as we deem appropriate. You will not receive any compensation of any kind for the use of your content. Another one is this service still tracks you even if you opted out from tracking. So the terms of service ask the user to please be aware that certain browsers cannot block or delete so-called flash cookies, which use a feature of the Adobe Flash video player to store information on your computer. For information about how to delete flash cookies, please visit the Adobe website. And this one is interesting because by making Adobe the responsible party for these cookies, they put the onus on the user to investigate and control how they're tracked. Another is many different types of personal data are collected. So according to the terms of service, they collect contact information, such as name, phone number, postal address, email address, account registration information, and that can include reminder questions and answers and communication preferences, payment information like credit card information, demographic information like gender, race, income, occupation, and online identifiers. So it collects a lot of data. And this service shares your personal data with third parties that are not involved in its operation. So they note that we may share any personal information we collect about you with these service providers and authorize them to collect personal information from you directly to support the services they provide to us. So acknowledging that they share with third parties. And one more, which is a pretty common one, they say digital technology is rapidly evolving. If we decide to change our privacy statement in the future, we'll post the changes here and indicate at the top of the policy the last date on which it was updated. Otherwise, all changes will be effective when posted. So acknowledging that things will change, sometimes companies will say, we won't notify you, we don't need to. We reserve the right to changes at any time. Uh, and that's where those emails come in, right? That we get flooding our inbox that say, hey, the terms and conditions have changed. Take a look if you want. So let's take a look at some other health and fitness apps. According to Apptopia, these are the top 10 most downloaded apps in this category. And now not every app on here can be found on that website terms of service didn't read, but we'll take a look at a couple that are. Uh, Sweatcoin. So this is an app that tracks your fitness routines and rewards you with coupons, swag, and discounts. While it doesn't have a rating yet, its terms of use have been examined, and there are some worrying aspects. Uh, if you'll notice, instead of asking directly, this service will assume your consent merely from your usage. So this is worrying because it assumes consent when it comes to your data being tracked and saved, and that's what's known as an opt-out data policy. So you might be familiar with opt-in and opt-out policies because of the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation that was passed by the EU in 2016. So this regulation gave more data rights to citizens and created more strict rules for the collection of data by third parties. The GDPR requires consent to be opt-in. It defines consent as freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous, given by a clear affirmative action. So it's not acceptable to assign consent through the data subject silence, or by supplying those boxes that are already ticked. As Jenny Gebhardt stated in the Electronic Frontier Foundation's recommendations for consumer data privacy laws, opt-in consent is far better for the public than opt-out consent. The default should be against collecting, using, and sharing personal information. Many consumers cannot or will not alter the defaults in the technologies they use, even if they prefer that companies don't collect their information. So what she's saying is, we often opt for convenience or aren't aware of these pre-ticked boxes. So these privacy settings, this data that's being collected that a company assumes we're okay with. And so it's much better to have opt-in policies than opt-out. And so this one, Sweatcoin, looks more like an opt-out data policy. This one, a period tracking app called Flow, is not on terms of service didn't read, but it did find its way into the public eye recently in a data-related controversy. So this company reached a settlement with the FTC after they were accused of sharing health information with third parties and for not deleting user data in a timely manner. 
So from a Wired article that ranked period tracker apps by their data privacy, even apps that invite data deletion requests may not always execute them in a timely manner or in a complete fashion. So Flow, whose security practices placed them under FTC scrutiny in 2021, they state specifically in their privacy policy that upon deletion of their app, they retain your personal data for a period of three years in case you decide to reactivate. So they admitted to retaining users' mobile privacy data for up to 24 months after receiving a request. The safest data apps should retain your data for 30 days or less and ideally submit deletion requests to third parties on your behalf as well. Flow does not. And here are some other health tools and apps our communities might be using. Insurance-specific apps. Mine, for instance, is called My UPNC. It keeps track of my prescriptions. I can use it for telehealth visits, and it has all my insurance information on it. There also might be employer-related health apps, especially if you're involved in incentives for maintaining fitness habits. Workout apps. So these got huge during the pandemic. Things like Quick workout prompts or running and walking route trackers might collect your location data. They might store it for long periods of time or in order to offer you milestone reports, et cetera. Often apps like Apple Health are already tracking your steps. You might have to specifically opt out of these kinds of apps. And MyFitnessPal, which was brought up earlier, was in the news in 2018 for a data breach, which brings up a really important point. Data breaches are always a possibility when we use data, when we use digital apps or tools. However, when the data collected by a company is more sensitive, health data, for instance, that can become a bigger concern. So according to a 2021 study, more than 93% of healthcare institutions have been victims of a data breach in the past five years. So this is a real threat. Digital health tools, this could be health quizzes and games. We should be especially vigilant about these because the companies behind the apps might be covertly selling you some product or service. So we want to make sure we, we know who's behind these games and quizzes. Companies like Weight Watchers and Noom offer online tools. They also might use your data for other purposes as well. And like we said, if the service is free, so Noom, for example, is not free, they cost money. And so if the service isn't free and you're still paying with your data, then you might need to decide if that's worth it, if you're paying with money and your data like Noom, they charge money and they also use your data for a lot of things. Period tracker apps like Flow and Clue track very specific health data, period timing. That can be so helpful, but what if this data is sold to third-party vendors who then know exactly when to market certain products and services to you? Wearable devices, because these track a ton of biometrics, including sleep patterns, geolocation, diet, and more, these are really important data tools. And I wanted to add COVID trackers here because it raises the question of public health and personal privacy. So speaking from personal experience, this became what we call an opt-out service on iPhones during the pandemic. But this is where a security exercise called threat modeling could come into play. So let's say you're an undocumented person or someone in an abusive relationship. How could this service impact your life? How important is privacy in this situation for someone? So these are really helpful for public health could be a risk for some people. And another thing to consider is who owns these apps. For example, Google owns Fitbit and Garmin, both fitness trackers. When a company that big owns app devices you use, you should be vigilant about your data privacy. Just like our Facebook and Instagram accounts might seem disparate, they're still connected and they're still owned by the same overarching company. In addition, apps like MyFitnessPal might be owned by a company like Under Armour, which it was until 2020. Then we might want to question if our data is being used to sell us things or if our data is being shared with other partner companies. Another big thing to keep in mind is that almost all of us use smartphones and digital tools to connect with people and make our lives easier. Many of us use fitness or health apps to track our workouts, conduct telehealth appointments, and more. Some of the same features in apps that enhance the convenience for some people can also put other people's information at risk. So I want us to remember that privacy is a tough subject and it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. It's hard to come up with a correct answer. And our goal here is not to give a blanket statement about all health apps or all fitness trackers. We're just taking a closer look and equipping ourselves and our communities with information. So I wanted to do a little activity 
I'm going to continue to move on, but you can do this kind of in the background as I move forward. Think about a digital health app or tool you use. Take a couple minutes to examine its privacy policy or its terms of service. So this app could be found on terms of service, didn't read, but remember that's run by a handful of volunteers. And as we heard before, there are thousands of health apps out there. So if you can't find yours on the site, you might look at the app itself or look up their website and you can find the policy there. And once you locate the terms of service or privacy policy for that app or tool, note any red flags like the ones we've seen today. So I know I've given you a ton of information so far and a lot of it can be pretty overwhelming. So where do we come in as library workers? How can we help our communities understand and mitigate the risks involved with sharing health data? One thing we can do is ensure that folks are getting the most reliable information possible. We can't make personal privacy decisions for our community members, but we can equip them with information, a healthy critical eye, and trustworthy resources. And one of those resources is the NLM and NNLM, the National Library of Medicine, and the Network of National Library of Medicine. So you might be familiar with some of these acronyms. It's easy to get confused about what exactly NNLM is, so the NIH is the nation's leading medical research agency. Under that is the NLM, National Library of Medicine. It's the world's largest biomedical library, and it makes a huge print collection and electronic information and resources like Medline Plus and PubMed available to folks. And NNLM is underneath that. That is the engagement and outreach arm of NLM. And there are seven geographic regions. Metro and New York are part of Region 7. NNLM, their mission is to provide equal access to biomedical information to both health professionals as well as the general public so that they're better able to make informed health decisions. And they do that through resources on their website, funding of projects, webinars. If your institution isn't a member of that network, I highly recommend joining. It's free. And once you sign up, you'll receive weekly postings about resources, trainings, funding, a lot more. So I wanted to just show you a few of the resources available from NNLM. So first, PubMed. PubMed is the National Library of Medicine's free database of more than 30 million citations to articles in the fields of biomedicine and health. And you can use that to find a specific research article based on some known information, like finding the original research that prompted a news story or find articles written by a particular expert. The NCCIH, it's formerly known as the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. So it's the lead government agency for scientific research on the diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that aren't considered part of conventional medicine. So they work really hard to determine what's promising, what helps and why, and what doesn't work and what's safe when it comes to alternative medicines and practices. So that's a handy health tool to consider for your own use if you take supplements or are curious about alternative treatments, but it also can be referred to when you're talking to library users. How many times have we been asked health information questions that have to do with new or alternative treatments? My own days as a reference librarian, these types of questions were about as ubiquitous as they come. So this way you can feel confident leading these folks to a trustworthy resource that acknowledges the validity of some alternative treatments, but also gauges harm and benefit through a scientific lens. And finally, Medline Plus, this is a great tool. It has a bunch of health topics that cover a wide range of topics, and it's a great place to start if you're looking up anything. And topics are available in a lot of different languages as well, making it a pretty versatile resource. And let's talk for a moment about teaching privacy. So Library Freedom Project uses a harm reduction lens. We come from a place of care. So we believe that everyone's relationship to privacy is individual and that what might feel comfortable for one person might not for the other. So when we teach, we hope to equip folks with knowledge so they can make informed decisions about their own privacy. So how do we talk about privacy with patrons? How can we teach privacy to our coworkers? I'll go over some tools really quickly at the end, but I just wanted to bring up this teaching philosophy again, just because this is a great foundation to consider when we're teaching privacy to our community members. People know where they fall on the privacy spectrum, what risks they feel comfortable taking. So we just want to make sure we equip them with information. And one of the hardest parts about teaching privacy is framing it in a way that doesn't strike fear in the hearts of your audience. 
So let's start with some reminders of why privacy is important on the positive side. Privacy is a core value of librarianship. It's essential to intellectual freedom. Privacy is a human right. Privacy is essential to autonomy. Marginalized people feel the greatest impacts from the loss of privacy. So making privacy a priority is one way to show commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in your space. And these tools take time, but it takes less time to learn about it than it does to deal with ransomware, identity theft, doxing, et cetera. So it's worth learning about it, worth taking extra measures. And finally, data is very powerful, but privacy is as well. I'm gonna go over some resources that you can use in your space that you can use to look further into this. One great resource is the Health and Privacy webinar series from Library Freedom Project. This was actually an NNLM funded project in partnership with Cherry Hill Library and the Chinese American Librarians Association. It was a five part series on health misinformation, the nuances of contact tracing and telehealth. They were really informative lectures with professionals from the field. The recordings are all available at this website. And we did this because COVID revealed a lot of systemic issues in our country and unleashed a multitude of new apps, as we heard. The goals with this project were that we wanted to improve the public's ability and the library workers' ability to read, understand, and explain wellness and privacy issues, to provide a broad overview of privacy issues, to increase understanding of privacy issues among library staff, and provide a lot of resources on health and privacy. It's really worth a look, and like I said, they're all recorded, so you can share them among your staff. Some print and web resources. These are just awesome educational resources. They're great for your own curiosity. They're also really helpful to be able to take and use in your own space. So the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is a nonprofit that works to promote online privacy. And they have a surveillance self-defense toolkit. And that's a guide to protecting you and community members from online spying. Another awesome thing they have is their security scenarios, which include best practices for specific populations with specific needs. So that's a really awesome part of this toolkit. They have one for LGBTQ youth that's particularly useful. So it teaches young users how to explore resources online in a safer way to help avoid accidentally outing peers or giving information to online advertisers. Tactical text data detox kit. This is a really cool toolkit. It's everyday steps you can take to control your digital privacy, security. They have awesome toolkits and guides available. They also have a youth-focused data detox kit. And they're also the folks behind uh, other toolkits like Me and My Shadow, which gives you sort of a foundation for exploring your own data footprint. Safe Data, Safe Families. This is a really great resource that they spent four years talking to library staff and families about privacy challenges, and then they collected all this and have programming resources, a lot of different places you can look for information, training for librarians, a really awesome resource. And finally, Library Freedom Project, of course. We have online and in-person trainings. We have a ton of free flyers, zines, and other stuff that you can print out, uh, and it's specifically been created for libraries to use. Um, so be sure to check that out. And that's it from me. Thank you so much. 